As I mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, the Koshi Gurzai theorem really is the cornerstone for a lot of um, important and impressive results in complex analysis. And uh, in this presentation, we will get a first taste of all the neat stuff that we can do with the Cauchy uh, integral theorem. And that goes through mainly what is called the Cauchy integral formula. The difference is the Cauchy theorem is a theorem and the Cauchy formula is a formula. And that is what passes for humor in an advanced math class. Let's just take a look at what this stuff does. Um, OK, so one of the most important in consequences of the cauchy gorsuch integral theorem is that the value of an analytic function at a point can be obtained from the values of the analytic function on a contour surrounding the point. And uh, that is, of course, as long as the function is defined on a neighborhood of the contour and its inside. And this is the kind of result that, again, actually is natural in a physical context, because physicists had known a long time before these results were discovered that the integral of an electric field over a closed surface is equal to the sum of the charges inside the surface. So there are these kinds of connections. If you're thinking about the, uh, the charge function now, there are these connections between a charge function and something else on the surface. The beauty uh, in complex analysis now is that you don't need any kind of uh, difficult operators in order to translate from one to the other. You're working with the same function all the time. Uh, that result is known as Cauchy's integral theorem. Um, okay, the, the one on, from electrodynamics is Gauss's theorem, but Cauchy integral theorem is this guy up here. And uh, among its consequences uh, is, for example, the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that every complex polynomial has at least one complex zero. Okay, every non-constant complex polynomial has at least one complex. Okay, always making sure we're correct. Non-constant complex polynomials have at least one complex zero. And uh, that is then, of course, also one of those results that really showed people that there is something to complex numbers as well as to complex analysis, because the fundamental theorem of algebra is very important for algebra, as the name, I guess, indicates already. And most of the reasonably quick proofs of that theorem all come out of complex analysis. I think there are algebraic proofs, uh, but they are much more complicated than, we're, than what we're going to see here. Excuse me, the phone rings. OK, what else can we do? Uh, we can, once we have introduced series, which technically we haven't, at least in complex analysis at this stage, another consequence is the fact that every analytic function is locally equal to a power series. And that is a very powerful result. And it's a cornerstone of complex analysis. Uh, in this presentation, we'll at least prove that analytic, fun analytic functions have derivatives of any order, which is also a result that, to a theorist, feels like a fairy tale. Basically, you prove that the function is once differentiable, and you get all the other derivatives, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. They all you get those for free because you know now they all exist. And that is something that need not happen for functions that are functions of a real variable that are not restrictions of complex analytic functions. Um, and the above are only highlights of the consequences of the Cauchy integral theorem. So let's get to it. Um, the Cauchy integral formula. We again talk about a simple closed curve C that is positively oriented and it's supposed to be piecewise smooth also. And we let the function f be analytic in a neighborhood of C in its interior. I think I changed language here because this mouthful ultimately just says simple closed contour, right? Or simple closed positively oriented contour. Contour is a piecewise smooth curve. Ah, uh, but either way. That's what we have, same setup as for the cauchy gorsuch theorem. Then for every point z0 in the interior of the curve, we have that f of z0 is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral of f of z min divided by z minus z0 uh, over c. And uh, well, we'll first take a look at an example, but that example actually will be used in the proof also. And it shows uh, that actually this integral of uh, of 1 over z around the unit circle uh, gives us the 2 pi i that we've seen there. So 
Let's first check out if it works for f of z equals 1 in the circle c of r z0 of radius r around the point z0. Well, 1 over 2 pi i integral of 1 over z minus z0 uh, over the curve c, and that's 1 over 2 pi i, uh, curve c being that circle, uh, that's 1 over 2 pi i integral from 0 to 2 pi, the parametrization of the circle around z0 is z0 plus r e to the i t. A lot of hiccups in this one. Okay, so the integral of 1 over z minus z0 over the circle of radius r around z0, if we parameterize that, the parametrization is z0 plus r e to the i t. z0 centers it and r e to the i t rotates around the center. Then, of course, we have to multiply with r i r e to the i t, which is the derivative of the parametrization. And if we simplify that, well, first the z0s cancel, and then we realize the i r's cancel 2 and the e to the i t's cancel so we end up with 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi dt and that's 1 which is f of z0 so this works for one function well big deal that on an abstract setting does not mean it's work for working for all of them but we're going to use this now to go to the general case so the proof now is well let's go back to the picture that we have already seen in the previous presentation here is our contour. Here is z0 and we can just go ahead and look at a little circle around z0 of radius r and if we just connect things up as we had done before we realize that the integral around the positive positively oriented contour is equal to the integral around the positively oriented circle if we deal with all the negative signs and remember these two pieces that join them up are needed to be able to apply the Cauchy integral theorem because here the singularity is not in the interior and then as we shrink these two gaps we have convergence and we have that these two integrals over the straight line segments actually cancel each other. So that means that the integral over th any contour around z0 positively oriented is equal to the integral of the same thing over a tiny circle around z0. And we're going to use that now because now we can take the integral f of z divided by z minus c0 over c, subtract from it 2 pi, f of, 2 pi i f of z0, just so we don't have to divide by 2 pi i all the time, take the absolute value of that, and we realize that that is, well, the integral over c is the same as the integral over that small circle around z0 and we had seen that f of z0 was 1 over 2 pi i times this integral so the 2 pi i cancels and we keep this integral here and we realize that's the integral over the same contour even the same denominator so we can combine things nicely now we use the triangular inequality for integrals where remember dz absolute value is just z prime of t absolute value dt and when we go to the parametrization uh, and we have the absolute value of this difference quotient here well but that is less than or equal to the maximum of the difference in the numerator absolute value of the difference in the numerator over the circle that we're integrating over times the integral of 1 over r because z minus z0 is always r uh, times the dz which is the z prime of t absolute value and uh, well the integral of over cr z0 absolute value z prime of t dt that's just the circumference of the circle so we keep the maximum we get 2 pi r as the circumference and the 1 over r is a factor that we took out of the integral and so that means that this is 2 pi times the maximum over the circle of radius r around z0 of f of z minus f of z0. And because f is continuous, if we choose r small enough, we can make this maximum arbitrarily small. And that means that the original difference is arbitrarily small and therefore 0. And that proves the theorem because if we have that this absolute value is equal to 0, then the stuff inside the absolute value is 0 and we can just solve that for f of z0 in order to obtain Cauchy's integral formula. 
Okay, so that's the formula. Let's take a look at the consequences that promised infinite differentiability, for example. That would mean now we're looking at f of z0 being this integral on the right side. And note that the right side is a function of z0. Well, so for fixed z, 1 over z minus z0 is differentiable in z0. Okay, so now we have to think a little bit back to how we work with multiple variables. We can differentiate with respect to one variable or the other. And if the left side depends on z0, and the right, then the right side depends on z0. And when we differentiate, we differentiate with respect to z0. So that means the integrand is differentiable in z0. So if we could move the derivative into the integral, we should get a formula for f prime. And that formula of f prime, we anticipate, of course, will involve 1 over z minus c0 quantity squared. So there's no reason to think that the process should stop there. And so that means for analytic functions, being once differentiable should imply that we have derivatives of any order. This is, of course, a hand-waving argument, something that motivates it. It's not a proof. But we're going to see that this is exactly what will give us the proof. This is the idea. OK, warning, however, this result, which is going to come on the next panel, and which was motivated on the preceding panel, does not work for functions of a real variable. For example, if I take f of x and make it x squared for x greater than 0 and negative x squared for x less than or equal to 0, so that's a parabola that you just take in the middle and then you bend the left branch down instead of up. The derivative of that thing is 2x absolute value, because for x greater than 0, the derivative is 2x. For x smaller than 0, it's negative 2x. And at 0, that's where you have to do a little bit of work. The derivative is 0. So that derivative really is 2x absolute value at every x. But 2x absolute value is not differentiable at 0. So even though uh, this thing is once differentiable, it is not twice differentiable. And that is exactly the kind of situation that does not happen with complex analytic functions. Because the next theorem says, and it's an extension of Cauchy's integral formula. Yeah, right. Uh, so we take a simple closed positively oriented piecewise smooth curve or contour, and we let the function f be analytic in a neighborhood of C and its interior. Then for every z0 in the interior of C and every natural number n, we have that f is n times differentiable at that point z0, and its derivative is fn of z0 being n factorial divided by 2 pi i integral over the contour f of z divided by z minus c0 raised to the n plus 1 dz. And um, for I mean, physicists, for example, would say, yeah, we just move the derivative inside, and then that's the formula that should come out. And that is indeed true. And that is how you can memorize this formula. However, the, um, and in fact, I wouldn't even memorize it. I would just memorize Cauchy's integral formula and then do this one directly through this differentiation process. But that just shows that the formula is reasonable. It doesn't prove the formula. And so we're going to now look for a mathematically watertight proof. And here it is. It's an induction on n. Well, that uh, having seen induction for a while now, that shouldn't be too surprising. Anytime we've got a parameter uh, that is a natural number, then certainly induction is a good option. Uh, let's take n equals 0. Well, then that's Cauchy's integral formula. You just plug in n equals 0, and it's the theorem that we've just proved. So that's not a problem. And if we go with the induction step from n to n plus 1, and oh, by the way, for n equals 0, the function is its own 0th derivative. That's why everything fits the pattern there. Uh, now we go from n to n plus 1. And that would mean we have to compute the derivative of the nth derivative. And again, here's where this stuff that, that feels a little bit unmotivated and certainly is tedious in early calculus comes back and we realize, yes, any time we have to compute a derivative, if we have nothing else available, such as here, we just have to write out the difference quotient. So this is the n plus first derivative of f if it exists. It's the limit w going to z0, fn of w minus fn of z0 divided by w minus z0. That's equal to, and we're just plugging in what we have from the induction hypothesis. So limit w going to z0 stays here. The 1 over w minus z0 is just this denominator here. No problem with that. And then this guy here is fn of w, and this guy here 
is fn of z0. Just go ahead and, and open the slides in a separate panel and make sure that that really is just the, uh, the formula substituted in. We've got a w here, we've got a z0 here. What we notice here is there's a bunch of stuff that we can factor out. Uh, also inside the integrals because the integrals are both over c so we can also take out the f of z and that's what we'll do. So we take out n factorial over 2 pi i, we've got the 1 over w minus c0 from here still, and we just subtract the integrands, okay, and now we realize we can take out the f of z inside, and we can pull the 1 over w minus z0 inside, I think, so now this is, well, limit state, n factorial over 2 pi i state, the f of z has been pulled out, leaving us with 1 over z minus w to the n plus 1 minus 1 over z minus z0 to the n plus 1, and the w minus z0 has been pushed inside the integral. And here is where we make a little jump because the interchanging of limits and integrals is actually fairly subtle. We have to show that this all converges of a certain order. That is also why we interchange the integral over c with the integral over a small circle around z0 where we can control this expression. But that being said, uh, the limit can be pu pulled in, and when the limit is being pulled in, then this difference quotient converges to the derivative of 1 over z minus z0 to the n plus 1, and that means we get that the n factorial over 2 pi i stays, the integral stays the same, the f of z stays, and the derivative of um, 1 over z minus z0 to the n plus 1 is negative n plus 1, 1 over n, 1 over z minus c0 to the n plus 2 times negative 1. And now we're going to simplify that. This is the expression from the previous panel. And uh, the negative signs, of course, go away. The n plus 1 with the n factorial together gives us the n plus 1 factorial here. Uh, the f of z we can put again on top of the z minus c0 to the n plus 2. We still have that circle around z0 of radius 1, which we needed to formally completely justify that if we wanted to expand on that, but we go back now and realize that the integral over that circle is the same as the integral over the contour, and that is the Cauchy integral, uh, the formula that we wanted to prove with n replaced by n plus 1, and so that concludes the induction here. Okay, as a corollary, if we've got an analytic function on an open domain, then all derivatives of f are analytic on this domain too. And moreover, the component functions, the real and imaginary parts, have continuous partial derivatives of all orders throughout the domain. Basically, what that says is by the previous result, we already know that f has derivatives of all orders. And that means that all derivatives are differentiable. And that means they, in turn, are analytic, analytic on the domain. And the real and imaginary parts have, by just continuously applying the Cauchy-Riemann equations, have continuous partial derivatives of all orders throughout the domain, because basically the real and imaginary parts, all the derivatives of the real and imaginary parts are in turn real and imaginary parts of higher order derivatives of the function f. And that takes care of that one. All right, now what else? Oh yeah, Morera's theorem is really neat now from a theoretical point of view because it connects integrability with differentiability. And what we typically know is that differentiability is a much stronger property than integrability. But it turns out if you have a continuous complex function on an open set so that for every simple closed curve contained in the open set we have that the integral of f over c is equal to zero, then the function f is analytic in the open set. And that is a really neat result because it takes properties that typically are considered weak, namely continuity, and they pair it with integrals over closed curves being zero, which of course turns out ultimately to be a very strong property, um, but looks rather weak, and it shows that from there, uh, the function actually turns out to be analytic, which means it's infinitely differentiable and all that other good stuff. The proof is, as far as I recall, fairly simple, actually, because, yeah, we've got this earlier presentation, uh, in fact, that was just the preceding presentation, that f has an antiderivative capital F. 
Well, by the preceding theorem, all derivatives of capital F, and that means it includes lowercase f, are analytic. And that's already the end of that proof. So that is, well, that's the kind of proof we like, right? That's quick, it's understandable, it forces us to remember theorems that we've just worked with, but which we need to think about anyway, and it, it doesn't involve lengthy estimates or anything like that. Okay, now we also want to prove the fundamental theorem of algebra. And to do that, we start with something that is called Cauchy's inequality. If f is analytic on a circle CRZ0 of radius capital R centered at Z0 and in the circle's interior, uh, my notation for circles, I think, is, is switching, but it's always a C, an R, and a C0, and a Z0. Um, if the absolute value of the function is bounded by a number m sub r on that circle, then for all natural numbers n, we have that the nth derivative at the center of the circle is bounded by n factorial m r divided by r to the n. And that's also pretty quick, I think, because the nth derivative at z0 is, by this theorem we've just proved, that's the absolute value of that nth derivative is the absolute value of n factorial over 2 pi i integral over the circle f of z divided by z minus z0 to the n plus 1 dz. And we just pull the absolute values inside, so triangular inequality for integrals, and that also means the absolute value of n over 2 pi i is just f, n factorial over 2 pi i is just n factorial over 2 pi. Uh, and again, we're integrating against z prime absolute value of t dt here. And now we check how big this thing is. And uh, we realize that f of z is bounded by mr, and z minus z0 to the n plus 1 is just r to the n plus 1. And uh, now these are constants that can be pulled out, and the integral of z prime absolute value of t dt, that is just the circumference. So this turns out to be the number is kept, this number is factored out, and the circumference of the circle is 2 pi r. And that means that's n factorial mr over r to the n after canceling the 2 pi and one of the r's, just as claimed. It turns out that that one is going to help us a great deal because, okay, now we prove Liouville's theorem and these results are all leading up to the fundamental theorem of algebra. If you have an entire function, uh, that is f is analytic on all of c, and if that entire function is bounded, then the entire function is constant. Proof, well, let f absolute value be bounded by b, right? If the function is bounded, then the absolute value is bounded. And let r greater than 0 be arbitrary. Well, then by Cauchy's inequality with n equals 1 for every z0 in the complex numbers, we have that the absolute value of f prime of z0 is less than or equal than b over r. Well, and that goes to 0 as r goes to infinity, and r did not depend on z0, so we can let r go to infinity. And so because r was arbitrary, we infer that f prime of zero z0 absolute value is equal to 0. And because z0 was arbitrary, that means that f prime is equal to 0. But then that means uh, if f prime equal to, is equal to 0, then f is constant. That basically um, comes out of um, an argument like what we've done when we constructed the antiderivative. You get f back by integrating f prime, and if pri f prime is 0, then uh, well, you're always integrating zeros, and so you just get the same value at every single point. Okay, um, so now we have the fundamental theorem of algebra, and that thing says that every non-constant complex polynomial has at least one complex zero. Okay, the proof is, well, let's just take a complex polynomial without zeros. And if we can show that that thing must be constant, then we have proved the result, because then the only way we can avoid having complex zeros is by being constant, and that means non-constant complex polynomials would have to have zeros. Okay, well, if this thing has no zeros, I can form 1 over p, and that thing is analytic. Um, and that's because the reciprocal of an analytic function is analytic everywhere where it's not zero, and this thing doesn't have zeros. Okay, so I claim now that 1 over p is bounded on the complex numbers. And to see that claim, we note that as z goes to infinity, 1 over p of z is equal to 0, because polynomials go off to infinity as z goes to 0. 
and that means the 1 over p of c goes to 0, right? And uh, that means 1 over p is bounded outside a, outside a large circle c of r of 0 for sufficiently large r, so that's a circle around 0. And the only way 1 over p could be unbounded inside the circle c of r of 0 is for the denominator to go to 0 somewhere. If the denominator did not go to 0 anywhere, then the polynomial is bounded away from 0, and that means 1 over p is, is smaller than some, one, than some 1 over epsilon. And that was excluded by the hypothesis because this thing was not supposed to have zeros. And that means 1 over p is bounded on the complex numbers. And that means by Liouville's theorem, 1 over p is constant. And that means p is constant. And that proves the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is um, even though we slash you have to think ourselves through a lot of stuff here, and it's, it's new stuff, I by no means want to say that this is trivial, but this is a fairly fast proof of a very important, in fact monumental result of mathematics, something that uh, mathematicians had looked to prove for a long time, and uh, now with all these tools that we have, it goes fairly quickly. Okay, we continue and conclude with something called the maximum modulus principle, which is going to talk a lot about um, assuming largest values. So here's a lemma. If a function f is analytic in some neighborhood z minus z0 smaller than epsilon of z0, and um, f of z is less than or equal than f of z0 for all z in that neighborhood, then in fact f of z must be equal to f of z0 for all z in that neighborhood. So that means if in some neighborhood your largest value is at the center point, then in fact the function must be flat. And the proof of that is that, well, by Cauchy's formula for all circles c of radius r around z0 with radius smaller than epsilon, we have that absolute value f of z0 is 1 over 2 pi i integral over the circle f of z divided by z minus z0 dz. And that's less than or equal by the triangular inequality than 1 over 2 pi integral over the circle of absolute value f of z divided by z minus z0 times d z absolute value, so d absolute value z prime of t dt if we chose to parameterize it. And now we knew that f of z was smaller or equal than f of z0, so that becomes smaller or equal than, the, than 1 over 2 pi integral over the circle f of z0 absolute value, the difference between z minus z0 on the circle is always r. We still have the dz absolute value. And that's f of z0 absolute value because we're dividing by 2 pi r and this is a constant and the integral of dz absolute value around the circle is just 2 pi r. So that means, well that's just a computation, but now realize the latter integral, meaning this one here, will be strictly, well actually this integral in the middle will be strictly smaller than f of z0 absolute value if there's even a single point z on the circumference for which f of z absolute value is strictly smaller than z0. So basically here this integral, if there's one point where f of z is strictly smaller than f of z0, then this integral here turn, uh, this inequality here turns into a strict inequality. And of course that can't be because f of z0 absolute value can't be strictly smaller than f of z0. So that means for all r smaller than epsilon and all z minus z0 equal that r, we must have that f of z is equal to f of z0. And that's what the theorem claimed. Well, that's close to what the theorem claimed. That means that f absolute value is constant there. But if f absolute value is constant, it can be shown using the Cauchy Riemann equations that then f is constant also. And uh, that's that. So now we're going to the maximum modulus principle. If f is analytic and not constant on an open domain, then f cannot assume its maximum value on the domain itself. Remember, open domains are open already and uh, connected, and I just re-emphasize that the domain is open here. Uh, so that is, there is no z0 in the domain, so that f of z is smaller or equal than f of z0, abs f of z absolute value is smaller or equal than f of z0 absolute value for all z in the domain. And the proof is, well, suppose for a contradiction that such a z0 exists. 
Well, then by the preceding lemma, f would be constant on a disk around z0. Moreover, we could choose the radius of that disk arbitrarily large as long as it stays inside the domain. Yeah, sure. Um, now take z1 to be another point in the domain. Well, there is an arc c from z0 to z1, and that arc will have positive minimum distance from the boundary of the domain. Okay, so there is a disk of maximum radius around z0 on which f is equal to fc, f of z0. The point on C that is in this disk and closest to Z1 on the arc C uh, has the same properties as Z0, so we can use that to go with a disk around Z1, around this new point, and in that fashion keep getting closer and closer to Z1 until we have that F of Z1 is equal to Z0. That looks a little bit fast, so this would prove that F is constant, which is a contradiction, and that would be the end of the proof. How does that connectivity argument go? Well, let's visualize it. Here's the domain as well as our point Z0. Here's our point Z1. Now, what we do know from the preceding result is that I can, well, okay, first of all, they're connected, so I can find a, a curve C from Z0 to Z1. Now I can draw a disk around Z0 on which the function is constant. Then I can find myself a center really close to the boundary of this thing, and I can draw another disk around it, and because the function is equal to f of z0 on this whole disk, this value at the center will again be the largest point within this disk, and so that means that the function must be constant on this next disk. I go to this point, f of z0 absolute value still is the largest value in the domain, so I can find myself another disk on which the function is constant, so now go, go here, draw a circle, function is constant, go here, draw a circle, function is constant on the circle, go here, draw another circle, and keep going like that. And by doing that, I keep pushing the places where f of z is equal to f of z0 farther and farther down this arc c. And of course, depending on how large a circle I can make, I may need more or fewer circles. It gets rather tight here, but we always advance at least a little bit. And ultimately, Basically, because of the preceding theorem, the, um, the, oh, come on, the function is equal to f of z0 on all of those circles, which means in particular it's equal to f of z0 at z1, and because z1 was arbitrary, that would mean that the function is constant, and that proves the maximum modulus principle. As a corollary, if, funct if f is continuous on a closed and bounded region and it's analytic and non-constant in, in the interior of that region, then the largest value that the absolute value will assume uh, will be assumed at some point on the boundary and it will not be reached in the interior. And that comes from two facts. One of them is that continuous functions will assume a maximum on closed and bounded regions. That is something that we're not going to prove in the context of this class, uh, but this is something that can be proved in a real analysis class or an advanced calculus class. So that means there will be a point in the closed and bounded region where we assume the largest value, but by the maximum modulus principle, the value will not be reached in the interior, and that is already the whole thing. Okay, so what has happened during those two last presentations. We've gone back from the computational to the conceptual. We have worked with a good bit of abstract mathematics, which thankfully also included visualizations. But, uh, and here I'm just currently checking right now, what this has given us is a large number of tools that we're going to use in the future to compute integrals and various other things. Before we go there, we're going to talk about uh, series expansions of uh, complex functions, of analytic functions, as also uh, announced in the introduction to this presentation. So for the next three presentations, we're going to first talk about series of complex numbers in general, and then talk about the fact that Complex analytic functions have a variety of very useful power series expansions, which will then allow us to do other things such as later on compute integrals on the real line, for example, strange as that may sound at this stage.
All right, thanks for your patience. Go through this very carefully, fill in gaps. If there's something that is in doubt, stop by my office or send me an email. We want to certainly clear up anything that is um, that is unclear up to this point and then just go through the homework and well, solve them right. Functions that are functions of a real variables that are not restrictions of complex analytic functions. Um, and the above are only highlights of the consequences of the Cauchy integral theorem. So let's get to it. Um, the Cauchy integral formula, we again talk about a simple closed curve C that is positively oriented and it's supposed to be piecewise smooth also. And we let the function f be analytic in a neighborhood of C in its interior. I think I changed language here because this mouthful ultimately just says simple closed contour, right? Or simple closed positively oriented contour. Contour is a piecewise smooth curve. Ah, but either way, that's what we have. Same setup as for the cauchy gorsuch theorem. Then for every point z0 in the interior of the curve, we have that f of z0 is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral of f of z min divided by z minus z0 uh, over c. And, uh, well, we'll first take a look at an example, but that example actually will be used in the proof also, and it shows, uh, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, the cauchy gorsuch theorem really is the cornerstone for a lot of um, important and impressive results in complex analysis. And uh, in this presentation, we will get a first taste of all the neat stuff that we can do with the Cauchy uh, integral theorem. And that goes through mainly what is called the Cauchy integral formula. The difference is the Cauchy theorem is a theorem and the Cauchy formula is a formula. And that is what passes for humor in an advanced math class. Let's just take a look at what this stuff does. Um, okay, so one of the most important in consequences of the cauchy gorsuch integral theorem is that the value of an analytic function at a point can be obtained from the values of the analytic function on a contour surrounding the point. And uh, that is, of course, as long as the function is defined on a neighborhood of the contour and its inside. And this is the kind of result that, again, actually is natural in a physical context because physicists had known a long time before these results were discovered, as well as to complex analysis, because the fundamental theorem of algebra is very important for algebra, as the name, I guess, indicates already. And most of the reasonably quick proofs of that theorem all come out of complex analysis. I think there are algebraic proofs, uh, but they are much more complicated than, we're, than what we're going to see here. Excuse me, the phone rings. Okay, what else can we do? Uh, we can, once we have introduced series, which technically we haven't, at least in complex analysis at this stage, another consequence is the fact that every analytic function is locally equal to a power series, and that is a very powerful result, and it's a cornerstone of complex analysis. Uh, in this presentation, we'll at least prove that analytic, fun analytic functions have derivatives of any order, which is also a result that to a theorist feels like a fairy tale. Basically, you prove that the function is once differentiable and you get all the other derivatives, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on. They all, you get those for free because you know now they all exist. And that is something that need not happen for func that the integral of an electric field over a closed surface is equal to the sum of the charges inside the surface. So there are these kinds of connections if you're thinking about the, uh, the charge function now, there are these connections between a charge function and something else on the surface. The beauty uh, in complex analysis now is that you don't need any kind of uh, difficult operators in order to translate from one to the other. You're working with the same function all the time. Uh, that result is known as Cauchy's integral theorem. Um, Okay, the, the one on, from electrodynamics is Gauss's theorem, but the Cauchy integral theorem is this guy up here. And uh, among its consequences uh, is, for example, the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that every complex polynomial has at least one complex zero. Okay, every non-constant complex polynomial has at least one complex. Okay, always making sure we're correct. Non-constant complex polynomials have at least one complex zero. 
And uh, that is then, of course, also one of those results that really showed people that there is something to complex numbers as uh, that actually this integral of uh, of 1 over z around the unit circle uh, gives us the 2 pi i that we've seen there. So let's first check out if it works for f of z equals 1 in the circle c of r z 0 of radius r around the point z 0. Well, 1 over 2 pi i integral of 1 over z minus z 0 uh, over the curve c, and that's 1 over 2 pi i, uh, curve c being that circle, uh, that's 1 over 2 pi i integral from 0 to 2 pi, the parametrization of the circle around z0 is z0 plus r e to the i t. A lot of hiccups in this one. Okay, so the integral of 1 over z minus z0 over the circle of radius r around z0, if we parameterize that, the parametrization is z0 plus r e to the i t. z0 centers it and r e to the i t rotates around the center. Then, of course, we have to multiply with r i r e to the i t, which is the derivative of the parametrization. And if we simplify 